Welcome to episode 3 of Terrain Rendering. In this video we're going to study a second algorithm for procedural terrain generation. This algorithm is called Midpoint Displacement and it was also published by Jason Schenkel in the Game Programming Gems and then used by Trent Pollack in the book that we are using in this series, Focus on 3D Terrain Programming. So what exactly is Midpoint Displacement? While fault formation try to simulate a certain tectonic activity by raising entire pieces of land, this algorithm focuses on a process called tectonic uplift, which creates mountain ranges due to the lateral pressure from the earth tectonic plates. I am definitely not a geologist, so I'm going to keep this background at a very high level and focus on the algorithm instead. Let's begin with an example in one dimension. Take a simple line segment, find the midpoint and displace it by a random value in the range minus h to plus h. h can be any value, but the rule of thumb is to make the displacement proportional to the length of the line segment by simply making h equal to half that length. We now have two smaller segments. Let's reduce h and repeat the same process on each segment. We continue until we reach an acceptable level of detail. To make h decrease with every iteration, we have to multiply it by a fraction, which is smaller than 1. The algorithm suggests to multiply it by the reciprocal of 2 to the power of r, where r is a factor of roughness. When the roughness is 1, it means that h is decreased by a factor of 2, which is also the factor by which the length of the line segments is decreased. This keeps the two values equal and the final result will be very balanced and pleasing to the eye. When the factor is larger than 1, it means that h is decreasing faster than the length of the line segment and this will create a smoother result with a few notable mountains. And vice versa. When the factor is smaller than 1, it means that the displacement becomes larger and larger with every iteration compared to the length of the line segment. This will make the terrain much rougher and chaotic. Ok, let's take it to the second dimension. We begin with a rectangle which covers the entire height map. Find the midpoint at the center of the grid and set its length to be the average of the height at the four corners. Since the grid is obviously flat at this point, there is no change, but we will also displace it by a random value between plus and minus half the terrain size. As you've probably guessed, we need to continue recursively into the four quadrants of the rectangle. Find the midpoints, take the average of the corners and displace it by a random value. However, this is not enough and the final result will look something like this. The reason is that in each quadrant only one corner, the original midpoint, is raised. The other three corners still have the same height and for simplicity, let's assume it is zero. This means that as we recurse further into smaller sectors of the rectangle, we are left with many points at zero height, breaking the natural terrain look that we need. Therefore, this process, which is called a diamond step, is immediately followed by a process called a square step. In the square step, we calculate the height at the midpoint of the four edges of the original rectangle. This is done by averaging the center of the two adjacent rectangles, as well as their corners on the common edge. As usual, the average operation is followed by a random displacement. The midpoints on the edges of the original rectangle are handled by a wraparound. For example, the midpoint on the right edge is the average of the top right and bottom right corners, as well as twice the height of the center. In terms of the software architecture, we are going to do the same thing that we did with fault formation. The algorithm will be implemented in a class called Midpoint Displacement Terrain, which will derive from base terrain. The generated heights will be stored in the height map and the triangle list class will continue rendering the grid without knowing which algorithm has actually been used. The implementation is pretty straightforward. We set the initial subrectangle size to the size of the terrain. After every iteration, we divide the subrectangle size by 2 
and the loop continues until it is zero. The height by which the midpoints will be displaced is initialized to half the size of the terrain. After every iteration, this value is multiplied by a factor, which is the reciprocal of 2 to the power of the roughness, which is a parameter supplied by the caller. The body of the loop contains the diamond step, followed by the square step. Both functions take the current subrectangle size and hide the displacement as parameters. The diamond step is the simpler of the two steps. We traverse the entire grid with steps of the subrectangle size. This provides the top left corner of each subrectangle. We get the coordinate of the bottom right corner by adding the rectangle size to both x and y. Notice that we do a modular operation on the result to handle the wraparound at the edge of the rectangle. Using the two coordinates, we can extract the height at the four corners of the rectangle. Top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right. The coordinate of the center is calculated by adding half the rectangle size to both x and y. We generate a random displacement in the range of plus to minus the current height and calculate the average of the heights at the four corners. Finally, we add the random displacement to the average and update the height map at the location of the center. This is it for the diamond step. The square step is just a bit more complex, but not much. In this step, we are supposed to calculate the height at the midpoints of the four edges of the subrectangle, but in practice, it's enough to do it only on the top and left edges. The right and bottom edges will be handled by the next rectangle on the same row and the one exactly below the current. So we traverse the grid in the same way and calculate the location of the bottom right corner as well as the center. In addition, we will need to calculate the center of the previous rectangles on the left and on the previous row. Since the result of this calculation can be negative in the case of a rectangle on the leftmost column or the topmost row, we add the terrain size before the modular operation. In the case of the leftmost column, this will wrap around to the rightmost column, and in all other cases will have no effect. The topmost row will wrap around to the bottom in a similar fashion. Next, we extract the height of six different locations. They will be used for the average of the two midpoints. The left midpoint is the average of the top and bottom left corners of the current rectangle, as well as the two centers, the current and the previous rectangle on the left. The top midpoint is the average of the top left and top right corners of the current rectangle, as well as the centers of the current rectangle and the one on the same column in the previous row. Also remember to add the random displacement as usual. Finally, we can update the height map at the two locations. After the core algorithm is complete, we do the same normalization between the requested minimum and maximum height, which we also did in fault formation. At this point, the algorithm works very nicely when the size of the terrain is a power of 2, which, by the way, is the recommendation of the original article. However, I would like to get rid of this limitation because, um, well, spoiler alert, it will make my life much easier when we get to GeoMeep mapping. But when we use a non-power of 2, in some cases we get an assertion that we try to access beyond the number of columns of the height map. The reason is that when the size of the terrain is a power of 2, and the size of the subrectangle decreases by a factor of 2 in every iteration, it means that we get no remainders on the edge of the height map. The height map is fully tessellated by the subrectangle. Therefore, the center of the current subrectangle is always valid. In the non-power of 2 case, the center may end up beyond the edge of the height map. The immediate solution seems to be to simply use a modulo when calculating the coordinate of the center of the current rectangle in the two steps. It solves the overflow, but the result is definitely not a terrain. The reason brings us back to the way the algorithm works fundamentally. We have to displace the midpoints and then use their updated heights in order to displace the next level of midpoints. This works very nicely with a power of 2 because coordinate 64 is used to displace 32, 
which is used to display 16 and so on. But if the size is for example 10, the size of the subrectangle will be 5 on the second iteration and 2 on the third. This means that we will access many points that haven't been processed in the previous iterations. Including these points in the average calculations brings down the height of the vertex and leads to the anomaly that we saw. The solution that I came up with is to initialize the rectangle size to the next power of 2 of the terrain size instead of the terrain size itself. This means that previous midpoints are reused correctly in the spirit of the original algorithm. Now in some cases I did notice a bit of a visual anomaly on the edge of the height map that I didn't like. I suspect that it may have something to do with the wraparound going too much into the height map on the other side. I replaced the wraparound with clamping of the coordinate to the edge of the height map and it seems the anomaly has been solved. Ok, I have to admit that I haven't done a lot of testing on that last part, so go ahead, play with it and let me know what you think. In the next episode we will leave those boring grey height maps in favor of a much better looking textured height map. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode of Terrain Rendering.